Mine Rescue. We plan for it, we train for it, we practice it. We even have contests to see what team can solve the problem the best and the fastest. But do we do enough? Are we truly prepared? Are we ready if a mine disaster happens? That's why we staged this underground mock disaster in a real environment. So here are the characteristics of the simulated mine disaster. An explosion has been reported. Smoke is coming out of the returns. Ventilation controls are destroyed. 16 miners are unaccounted for. And the mine is located in a remote area. District 4 wanted to be involved in a mock disaster to try to get the, uh, uh, as many people involved uh, in a situation that would, uh, uh, should an actual emergency arise. We wanted to test the, uh, our ability to respond to a, an emergency uh, and do that in conjunction with uh, conditions that simulated as much as we possibly could, get the rescue teams involved in some uh, underground work uh, as opposed to working in a uh, mine contest type atmosphere. The groups we uh, were concerned with were the mine operators, the uh, uh, state of West Virginia, and the uh, MSHA, and the uh, miners' representatives, UMWA, whatever you know the representation is, and uh, that we could all work together in command center, that everybody should there ever become a need would know, would be familiar with what to do. And like I say, we could expose any faults or, or what that we might have. Uh, when, when we first started that morning, when we got the phone call and everything started, it was very hectic for about uh, two hours. Roger, Roger has called. You started your briefing yet? Yeah, we've got 16 people underground that's not accounted for, and we've got smoke coming out of return. What's on fire? They were welding at a belt. Two breaks in And And for at least a little while uh, starting out, you deal with who's in charge and who's going to take charge here. Hey Jim, could I request something? When we do our briefings, I'd just like for the four of us to be in here and everything. Everything that goes on here will go through that command center. The most important thing we've got to make sure is that they... They had a command post for the high officials and then they, they would inform the other command post what they were going to do. So it was actually going through four chains of command. The main command post, the command post, fresh air base, and then to the teams. What we've got is what we would like to do is start a mine rescue team underground. To this point, those players here establish a fresh air base. We would like to take two more teams underground to the fresh air base and begin another team that's going in this direction. There's a lot of confusion at the start. Uh, but after about an hour, uh, the teams and the command center and everybody, uh, they start getting a little more serious about it, and then they start working the problem. One of the problems of the disaster was my mind phone went dead. So in trying to get it, find another mine phone, get it hooked up and get the communications established again, threw me off. Communication, once we got in by the fresh air base and what we told our briefing officer and he reported to the command center and we wanted to do something, it just seemed like it took too long to get the inf information from outside back to us and permission to do something. We were down at the mine office that morning and we were waiting there to be called up, our team to be called up. And while we were there, there was state troopers went by, there was ambulances went by, there was fire trucks went by. A lot of the guys had never seen this before, been around it. They really thought that really something had really happened. This was a real good training exercise for everybody involved, especially the teams, because of the difference in the environment that we were working in. Normally a mine rescue contest is, is pretty much limited to three or four entries, three or four cross cuts. Uh, here we had uh, seven or eight entries, 15, 20, 30, 40 cross cuts to explore. And the uh, things that teams would normally do in a contest that might take them 30 seconds might take four or five minutes in the actual situation. Out here on the field you could 
you can look across one heading and see what's in another heading, or you can look through a crosscut and see what's at the end of that crosscut. Underground, in that mock disaster, you can't do that. The difference between a uh, this mock disaster we've done and a mine rescue contest is uh, rules are written for mine rescue contest that can't apply when you're actually exploring underground. You try to apply your mine rescue rules to the disaster underground, but you can't use those rules that you use in competition underground. It's just too much difference. The people outside making decisions uh, seems like it takes an eternity, uh, 15, 20, 30 minutes to relay back uh, an okay to do something or no, do something else. And the mine rescue teams are trained to do it and, and generally do it in two, three minutes max. Tell him I want to build a temporary stopping across entries. One, two, four, five, six, and seven. One, we had to wait on permission to come from the command center. Well, we really never took into uh, perspective, you know, all the things they have to figure on at the command center. We knew what we wanted to do, and we really didn't like having to wait for permission from the command center to do it, but it's, you know, you have to wait for their permission to do it. I don't know. It's, the guys that's never been through this is just unreal because they're, it's completely different from anything, or any competition or anything else. These two situations, the mock disaster that we had and the, and the normal mine rescue contest that we do, we're just about opposite ends of the scale. In the mine rescue contest, uh, every second counts. You have to try to make real quick decisions and keep moving along real fast. And this type of exercise, uh, slow and steady was what we wanted, uh, being careful that you were uh, sure that you had all the right information, uh, all the possible information that you could get, and then, then make your decision and uh, go about your work in a, in a more uh, steady pace so that uh, you didn't overlook anything, didn't take any chances. Do you have room set aside? For we have room set aside uh, at the local church down here for the families. Uh, we're starting to gather uh, uh, media people. We're setting up a media room at the main office down below. I was assigned then to handle the mock media whose job it was to be treated as we would actually treat the media in an, in an emergency, which meant, you know, we had to have a press room, we had to have uh, badges, we had to have people signed in, we had to take care of their training and any other needs that they might have during the day, such as uh, phone service. The one problem we did have was the mock media decided they wanted to really be media, and they were digging for the story. And they didn't want to stay in the press room, they wanted to go run around on the property, look for ways in, you know, check with the guards, try to get through the gates. No one's coming up on this hill unless it comes through through me. We've got the gates uh, secured. I understand at this time we're starting to uh, have a lot of people gather down below. Uh, of course, we also had a family center set up. And we had other people who were in charge to give the information to the families. So we had to coordinate any announcement we made with them to make sure families were notified ahead of time the things that we were finding out from the mine. Okay, the family's located at the Printer Free Will Baptist Church. You can never give the family information fast enough, I've found. Uh, even though we may have been giving it to them on a, like a 30-minute schedule, they wanted it continuous. We have sat down and formulated plans on how to deal with the family, how to deal with the news media, uh, things of this nature. I think that's primarily one, one or two areas that we saw we maybe need the most work in. I don't think you can probably have enough people from, the, from your organization there to deal with the family members. Uh, I think we learned that uh, as far as MSHA goes that we have different field offices and, and, and uh, we very seldom get a chance to work together as one unit. And, I think this taught us that we need to do more of that because we shouldn't be perfect strangers. And I think these drills give us certainly a valuable place for that, that process to, to evolve and everyone to learn their roles and exactly how we, how we co-mingle in this situation. You know, we found out some things that we've got to work out. We had some confusion at the Fresh Air Base and getting our information from us to the briefing officer, to the command center, back to the briefing officer and back to us. So, you know, we're going to try to work on some kind of communication system to where we can talk to the briefing officer and directly to the command center to cut down the confusion. The mine foam coming to the surface, 
that should have had a loudspeaker on it or some type of, of means of communicating to the room. Uh, when you're trying to communicate through one man and then him turn around and communicate to everyone else, you know, there's bound to be a breakdown here and there's certainly a time delay in that. Well, we had a map and they had a map and they were relaying information off of their map back onto our map. And, and anytime you're transferring information and going through a third party like that, there's always, uh, there's always a possibility of losing information or not receiving all the information. Look at the company would have set one official in place in the command center and that individual stayed there and they'd established their communication via telephone or however they wanted to do that with uh, the mine foreman's office. When that information flowed in, the president of the company, the chief official for MSHA, and a chief official for the state and labor could have heard the information in unison. You need to have the teams that haven't been exposed to this type of situation there and hands on. Yeah, if anything, maybe to get away from the contest rules a little more. Uh, several of the teams work, worked it real similar to like they were working in an actual contest. You know, they seemed like they were worried about uh, getting discounts for a violation instead of uh, taking care of the task at hand. We need to be more careful to give uh, uh, more complete information in the outlining of the incident, the, the layout of the incident, so that people will know uh, what to expect. One of the things that I noticed dealing with the press is that as much as possible, everything we do should be within our company boundaries. And I say that by like HealthNet making their flights. Uh, if at all possible, HealthNet should land in a secure area. Uh, we landed them there beside of where we were keeping the press and you can imagine there was no way to keep the press back so they're out there trying to take videos and pictures of people going between ambulances and health net helicopter and had this been an actual emergency I'm sure that the community would have been able to get too close to this area. The main thing that I think that everybody learned in, in was that, that we can work together as all different agencies, enforcement agencies, companies, uh, uh, miners, reps, whatever, we all can come together in a time of need like this. It was an excellent exercise, training exercise for I'm sure everyone involved from the mine rescue teams to the MSHA and state officials and our company officials. I'm sure all of us learned a great deal out of it. The, the mine rescue teams uh, that, that I spoke with, and we have a mine rescue team on site, they, they said that this was uh, a lot better than the uh, mine rescue team contest that they're involved in because it's more realistic in, in what they do encounter underground situations. Uh, they found out a lot of things about their apparatus uh, and, and the way they worked underground and, and it's, it really was beneficial to everyone. Here there's competitions between the teams. When you get to that mock disaster or a real disaster, all the teams are one. I mean, you have no, no competitors in. I mean, everybody works together. Well, in my opinion, is the best exercise I've been involved in in you know, the 14 years I've been with Mine Rescue. And uh, we did explode, expose a few problems in the uh, company's uh, emergency plan. Well, I think we found a couple in ours, and these will be addressed and and uh, and uh, changed in the future, I'm sure. But everybody, the whole team enjoyed it, and you know we worked as a team. The good thing about it was, is when we were at the Fresh Air Base we could hear Coal River's communications. So we took our map that they gave us and we worked along with them. We knew what they were doing before we went. Uh, it allowed us the opportunity to check our procedures to see whether they work, they don't work, where are some of the difficult areas that we maybe need to look at again. I think it was good for MSHA. It was a big training tool for them to be able to, to learn how to organize themselves in this situation. The state, I think everybody concerned, gained a great deal of experience and are going to be a much better prepared to step into this situation if it does really occur. And as far as this exercise, by far I think every district ought to have one of them somewhere at least a yearly. To have to go through this, and, and for the teams, I think it was particularly beneficial for them, particularly teams that have never been to a situation like this, because at least now if they, if they do get called, they have some type of feeling of what they're about to step into. I think it's going to make the teams more ready. I think we should have something like this every year. I mean, to me, all mine rescue teams should be involved in this, not just the ones that want to come. If they're going to be a mine rescue team, they need to be involved. They need to see what's going to happen. The team's got a real education. I, I talked to a few of them after it was over with, and that was their comment was, 
this is different. You know, you got to back out and look at it as a large coal mine, not a little three-entry system like we conduct our contest in. All the people involved in it gained a lot of knowledge, gained a lot of experience that otherwise they would not be uh, subject to, and and it and it showed uh, it, it showed the true meaning of what uh, IMSH is all about and what the companies are trying to do and and how the union people are involved in this, and it, it really. Uh, it was really good for everyone. It, it makes sure that we are prepared in case something ever does, ever does happen of this nature.